Hello, this is Clarence Moy with Awards Daily here with Betsy West and Julie Cohen, the directors of the new documentary, Julia, which has been shortlisted for the Academy's documentary shortlist for the 2022 Oscar nominations. Ladies, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Great to be here. Nice to be here. Excellent. So uh, I feel like I should say something French or, or Julia-esque, but it's, <laughs> it's sort of escaping me right now. So I'll just say bonjour to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> bonjour. <laughs> I was gonna say uh, I was gonna say hello like she did, but then I, as as I practiced it, I always sounded like Mrs. Doubtfire. So <laughs> anyway, um, so I want to start with asking, how many dishes of Julia's did you try to cook when you preparing when you were preparing to make this documentary? You mean cooking as part for the food that's part of the film? No, you yourself just oh, to get to a... know her, to get to clo get closer to her as a subject. In a personal way, actually, I would say I personally got sort of a little bit more into the Julia cooking as the process mm -hmm. uh, progressed. It wasn't really part of the prep for the film to uh, intimidate oneself with uh, with Julia <laughs> recipes, although um, actually myself and Betsy both love uh, food and cooking, and that's part of what made this seem like such a kind of... Uh, delicious and fun prospect to, to, to dive into this uh, subject matter, but really learning Julia's life story and learning mm -hmm. what foods were key for her evolution, I think was maybe a little bit more important to us than mm -hmm. cooking. The food kind of came in later in the filmmaking process. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted, as I was watching it, and of course you, in, you insert, you know, the images of the beef bourguignon, which is one of her signature dishes in the film, uh, I wanted to make it, but unlike her advice, I'm just not bold enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. It's actually, Ina Garten has a Julia Child inspired beef bourguignon recipe, which is a little bit easier and it's pretty foolproof, actually. Just okay, takes so I was, a while. You've got to put some time aside. Right. Well, I was looking through the recipe and I saw that it needed, like, I think it's, it required a Dutch oven and I, I lost there. I don't have a Dutch <laughs> oven, so... <laughs> um, so this documentary is obviously about not only her food, but her life, her political um, leanings and all of those aspects that make her a fully fledged human being. So why Julia Child and why now? You know, I, I think that uh, when we first started thinking about Julia Child, we didn't know the whole story. We didn't know the fact that Julia didn't become really the Julia Child we know until middle age, which was kind of fascinating to us. And we also started to think about the impact that Julia had on our world. I mean, both Julie and I grew up at a time when, you know, TV dinners and uh, mushroom <laughs> soup casserole mm -hmm. were on the menu in home cooking. And, you know, it was a pretty bleak landscape of food before Julia introduced people not only to French cooking, but just to great ingredients and to the idea of, of what food could mean for you. So mm -hmm. incredible impact. Also an extraordinary person on television. You know, I, I remember <laughs> public television in the 1960s with all those kind of, you know, white men boring lectures. And, you know, Julia transformed that. The first uh, real public television star who was a middle-aged woman. So, you know, we felt in a way that, uh, you know, people think about Julia Child, they think about Dan Aykroyd, they think about that, you know, that stereotype and that there's so much more to this person and mm -hmm. that it would be a fun project to dive into. Absolutely. So before we launch into talking more about her and the things that you discovered about her along the way, I do want to talk about, and, and uh, uh, Julie, you mentioned this already, the, the film uh, scenes of cooking within the film. Um, those are sumptuous and delicious looking and, and gorgeously photo, like the, 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 what I loved the juxtapos juxtaposition of that, the creation of that pear tart with the, the talk of her sex life. Um, you know, it was just, I'm sure that's intentional. It just, it, it just so beautifully worked. So um, tell me about including those sequences. Tell me about the process and filming and why you picked what you did. 
Yes. Well, the choice of what food to include in the film was really the very last decision we made. Mm -hmm. um, the two of us and our genius editor, Carla Gutierrez, had already roughed out uh, close to a f sort of somewhere between a rough and a fine cut of the film before we put in the food sequences because we knew that we didn't want the food to just seem like decoration or an afterthought. We really wanted it to be completely woven with the story. So in order to do that, we wanted to put the story together and then figure out which of Julia Child's recipes could really serve um, the story, sometimes directly, because Julia tastes Sol Meunier when she goes to France and it changed her mm. whole life. So obviously we're gonna include some incredible Sol Meunier. But in other cases, such as the pear tart that you mentioned, sometimes food, the food is part of the story itself, but it's also kind of a metaphor in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the case of uh, the pear, pear tart scene or what we like to call the sexy pear tart scene. It's a, <laughs> it's a metaphor for her uh, sensual relationship. Um, with her uh, her husband and we certainly wanted those scenes to feel really cinematic like actually baking a pear tart has a narrative arc to it um <laughs> and so making that part of the storytelling was uh kind of part of the joy of this film you know we'd never done anything like that before so i think that was part of the challenge when we started thinking about hey julia child the opportunity to take advantage of the cinematography that's available now. We actually worked with two cinematographers, Claudia Rashke, who uh, we had worked with on RBG, who did all of the shooting in a kitchen that our uh, producer had built as a replica, Julia Child kitchen, totally wow. uh, matching the whole layout of, of what she had in her kitchen in Cambridge with all the copper pots on the pegboard mm -hmm. and the garland stove. And then we also had uh, a, a cinematographer in Paris who specializes in food photography. So when you say sumptuous, all of those close-ups and the slow-mo and you know where the food just looks so yummy and also you know impressionistic, artistic, those were done by Nanda uh, Bretelard and then Cloud uh, and then Carla integrated uh, the two different uh, food. Uh, shoots together. Um, you know, we had them all prepared by our food stylist, Susan Spungen, whose hands you see in the pear tart. Uh, she was our consultant on this. She helped pick the, the recipes and then she executed them in the kitchen in, uh, in New York. I think that might be a job that might be my fourth career when I'm older as a food stylist. That's yes. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, who knew there was such a thing? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you think about it, though. I mean, food is photographed in magazines all the time. It has to look right. I mean, obviously, people won't want to, to buy the magazine or cook the food. Um, getting into Julia herself, when you consider the wide range of impact that she's had on, on American culture, not only to American women, but to the American food scene, as you've mentioned, moving away from that, the TV dinners of the 50s into starting to prepare things on your own, um, and up into the elevation of television chefs as, as sort of a, a cult of celebrity there. What do you think her most significant accomplishment was? <sighs> I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's sort of a tie. Um, one would just be increasing Americans' interest in food as a major piece of culture. Like, you know, part of why we wanted to make this film is to remind you that someone like a Julia Child isn't silly. I mean, there there is a there is a tendency to caricature her and. I, we think that the fact that she's a woman is kind of relevant to that and like realizing like, no, she, yes, she was entertaining um, on television, but like what she was doing wasn't trivial, like making Americans start to really incorporate a view that is true in, you know, many, many parts of the world, certainly China, Europe, Latin America of like the, the essentialness of food as a kind of shared cultural activity. Julia brought that to us. And she also brought us to understand that a woman matters a lot, you know, perhaps beyond how lovely and decorative uh, she might be. Like she came on television 
tall, loud, gangly, not a classical beauty. And yet within months, she was a superstar. Everyone loved her, not just, mm -hmm. not just women. Men thought she was amazing too. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's really interesting when you think about the the broad reach of her cultural influence. I mean, I think you wouldn't even see something like Pixar's, one of my favorite films, Pixar's Ratatouille, without right. her influence. I mean, you Absolutely. know, it, it, everyone can cook is the theme of that film. And I think that's something that she brought forward too, very interestingly. And I was also very interested in the, the commentary toward the end of the film where you start to look at the movement to move to... Um, farm fresh produce and things like that. And that was sort of, I think you mentioned in the documentary, that wasn't necessarily her requirement for cooking, that it was all about making something that was accessible to the average uh, person cooking, housewife or, you know, a man or whoever was cooking. Um, that wasn't something that she was necessarily buying into. I thought that was really fascinating as well. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, when she was in France cooking in the 1940s and, and the 50s, most of that food was what we would now call sustainable or farm to table. I mean, right. she was going right. to markets and buying that kind of food. I think that um, her initial reaction to so-called nouvelle cuisine was a, perhaps a little bit defensive mm. uh, about this development, but she quickly evolved and really embraced a lot of the values that uh, younger chefs were embracing about fantastic ingredients that are cooked during the season in which they're grown as opposed to, you know, tomatoes that are stored for six months and then brought out at that time. I mean, Julia came to appreciate that and, and her own uh, cooking evolved a, as things went on. I mean, if it was, it's been interesting to, to Julie and me to talk to uh, not only the chefs who were in the film, to Jose Andres and Marcus Samuelson, Ina Garten, who clearly put Julia at the center of their world of influence, but so many younger chefs that we've spoken to in the course of talking about this movie who consider Julia to just be the, the beginning of the opportunity for uh, Americans to appreciate, as Julia said, just the, the, the culture and the joys of food. Absolutely. But it does make you want to sort of invent a time machine so you could travel back in time to the to post-war France and 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 revel in those fresh produce and all the things yeah. that were. I mean, it was just such a loving look in that at that time um, through her eyes, too. And, and we were lucky with our archive to be able to capture mm -hmm. that, you know, to get some of the archive footage, not of just of Julia going through the markets, but other people. And, you know, the photographs, the fantastic photographs that her extremely talented husband took of Julia as she was as she was learning how to be a, a cook. One of the things I love the most about the documentary too is that it celebrates not only her successes, but it also underscores the fact that she said, you're going to make a mistake and that's okay because you can you can recover from that mistake. Food, yes, but also within her her opinions, right? So you you talk about you know the fact that she used uh, homophobic slurs at one point, but then quickly recovered from that. It, so this documentary doesn't become a hagiography. It just, it's a fully fleshed out vision of who she was as a person. When you, uh, you know, obviously you are women yourselves. When you look at women watching this documentary and you start to talk about her opinions on marriage of in, in the 50s and 60s, where she's got the, the three Fs and I'll let our viewers find out what the three Fs are. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you think that women are reacting to that today, given that perspective, that shift in, in, in the culture and, and sort of what we tell women today about marriage? Yeah, you know, part of what Julia's audience is from the time she first appeared on television, even to now, you know, almost two decades after her death, part of, part of what people respond to about Julia's story is how authentic she is, how she's always just being Julia in every circumstance. That might mean that we're exposed, that the public is exposed to some of her real weak spots, such as you mentioned, uh, homophobia that she sort of beautifully evolved past. Um, uh, but um, one area that we kind of wanted to explore in the film, because we like making films about amazing women and we consider ourselves feminist filmmakers, like in, in most cases, films that we've made have been sort of like very clearly about feminists. Mm -hmm. With Julia, it's a little more complicated because as we show in the film, people asked her in, in the day, you know, she becomes a big star in 
you know, the early 60s when nobody's thinking or talking about feminism or certainly not that the culture isn't in general, then the world undergoes this massive shift in the next uh, 10 to 15 years where women's lib, as it was what was has how it was described in the day is kind of all the rage. And when Joy is asked if she's a women's liver, well, you heard her answer. She's a little bit taken aback even by the right. question because she correctly understands that people are often going to view someone who's connected to the women's love movement as being like not a very good wife, mm -hmm. you know, not having the right sort of womanly vibe, like, oh, you know, th throughout, throughout various waves of, of feminism, feminists have been identified as a backlash, you know, often intentional strategy with all kinds of bad things. You have no sense of humor. You're ugly. You're a man hater. Like, you know, who, who would want to associate themselves with that. The fascinating thing about Julia is that even while she's kind of theoretically distancing herself from the words women's liberation, everything about her life, as we hope the film shows, really identifies her squarely with feminists. She wants to be treated equally with men. She cares a lot about bringing up women chefs behind her. She's going into kitchens saying like, and, you know, kind of like really pointedly saying to the chefs, like, where are all the women in this kitchen? She's out there loudly advocating for reproductive rights, you know, even when her audience uh, in middle America doesn't necessarily share her views, she's loudly saying that. So like, she's a fantastic feminist role model, even while not really identifying herself at, at, as a feminist. It's a fascinating paradox and one that we hope the film makes people think about. Absolutely. And, and, you know, she's a human, she has her opinions, you know, she's, and, and, and you may not agree with everything, but, but, you know, to be a woman in the fifties working in a French kitchen surrounded by men must have been, you know, an extraordinary time for her just emotionally, just, uh, you know, I, I know you've got some letters from that. I wonder if there were um, other letters that came from that period that sort of expressed what she was dealing with at that moment of her, of her life. Cause you know, it, it, I think in, um, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the Nora Ephron film, Julie and Julia does uh, fictionalize or dramatize some of those early sequences where they seem to be more hesitant or more resistant to her being in the kitchen. There Were there any um, letters that you had that perhaps didn't uh, show up in the film that were? Um... No, I mean, we, we okay. as, as much as we had from, from Julia, from her diaries and from her letters uh, express that. But I think, you know, by the time Julia, uh, entered the domain of the, the, the very masculine domain of the Cordon Bleu, she was uh, a kind of a, a confident person. And she really wanted to do this. She was already almost 40 years old. And she realized that this was an opportunity that uh, as an American woman, she'd never experienced food like this. How does it happen? How can I make this? And clearly I'm capable of doing it. I mean, the other thing about, thing about Julia is of course, she had a feminist husband behind her who was supporting her all the way. So even if she was being dissed or uh, dismissed in the kitchen a little bit, it seems as if it just kind of rolled off her back. And certainly Paul was giving her all kinds of support to go out there and learn how to cook. I mean, he was a beneficiary of it. Yes, he, he was, was. getting those <laughs> incredible lunches every day. Uh, but then, I mean, of course their feminist love story went even further than that because mm -hmm. when Paul's career declined and Julia became this kind of instant success on television with the opportunity to take this show, The French Chef, and to, to really kind of lean into it and to spread her message. I mean, Paul just quickly adapted and was like, okay, my career in the State Department is over, but look at what Julia is doing. And you and, and we found that a part of the story, just so moving how Paul embraced Julia's success and helped Julia become a success. Absolutely. So a question for both of you. Um, a lot of people bring preconceived notions of who Julia Child was into reviewing something like this. What was something that each of you learned about her that you did not know that has sort of stuck with you? You know, I would say the activism. Um, I mm -hmm. thought of Julia Child, I'm gonna say as a TV character, which actually isn't 
isn't a good way to think about somebody who made some amazing changes in our culture. That's actually how I had always thought of her before um, coming into this project. So understanding that she was a human being who had a lot of ambition and who ultimately, ultimately kind of had an agenda to use her very public role in all sorts of ways for the good. Like uh, that was just fascinating, especially someone that I'm like, that we were so familiar with. It's like, wow, how could I know so much about Julia Child and not have known that she was doing benefits for AIDS research and that she was out there advocating for Planned Parenthood? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that before I did this, I would have imagined that Julia Child was someone who grew up, was cooking from the time she was a teenager and kind of was on this path. The fact that Julia, didn't discover her love of food until she was a middle-aged woman and that she worked so hard 12 years writing that book and just digging into uh, perfecting her craft and uh, you know becoming um, so successful in middle age and then continuing to evolve not just kind of resting on her la laurels with the French chef but moving and creating new shows and new cookbooks and incorporating new ideas and changing her point of view about homosexuals. I mean, this was a person who was always learning, always moving and, and who didn't find her passion until middle age. I mean, as an older woman myself, I found that pretty inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. You have to think too that that passion and that, that, that joy for life really kept her going into her 90s. I mean, you know, Absolutely. and she did not eat healthily, right? I mean, that's that's a thing. She loved butter. <laughs> and uh, but but yet she she passed at 91. So you have to think that that the ability to reinvent herself to find that passion for all things food, life, love into her later years kept her going. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, you don't, uh, doctors don't and even can't prescribe joie de vivre, but I think it has a lot to do with Julia Child's longevity. I would agree. Well, I think those are all the questions I have for you. Beautiful documentary. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and best of luck to you. Thank you, Clarence. Thank you so much. Take care.